sitting at lunch trying to think of how this might go, I began to, uh, the, the, the image of, of the wiki began to come to mind. Um, in other words, an approach to um, what is a, a vast atmospheric topic, that being this intersection of faith and art, um, but one in which we, uh, as a community, begin to sort of build a base of issues, questions, um, and perhaps some knowledge and, and um, uh, practical models for tackling some of these things. Um, so as such, um, just as you could in Wikipedia, um, you could uh, simply add something to this uh, particular delineation of an idea or a topic. And um, we want to be clear that while we do have panelists up here as kind of um, touch points and, and point people, um, that we do consider this a sort of a community conversation. Um, encourage you, anyone not to be shy. It will be helpful if you can do the, the Emory Wedge um, as a way of helping us um, if it seems that a topic is, um, it, that it, it would be appropriate to continue in a particular vein before branching off, um, it just helps in the direction of, um, of the afternoon. Um, we're gonna talk for about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, and then we'll take about a 10 minute break um, to give everyone a breather, and then we'll continue on for the rest of the session. Um, so now um, we're gonna let each of uh, our round table participants and uh, it, briefly, and then we'll launch into it. You should have a microphone. In fact, you should have this one. <laughs> I can try out my lungs and see what capacity they have otherwise. Um, my name is Linnea Spranzi, and I'm a painter, and there are two pieces of mine here, but um, I think the reason I am sitting up here is because I've experienced that odd conflation of being a believer in really high intensity training environments for the arts, as in like graduate school and all that sort of thing. But then I've also worked um, by sheer dogged persistence for the last 10 years in my craft exclusively. Um, and that's found me in different environments, different places. Um, so uh, hopefully that'll qual qualify me slightly to be able to talk about some of these things, but I myself have a lot of these questions in my own heart, so <laughs> um, maybe I'll have something to say. Hello, uh, I'm Anna M.R. Freeman. I'm from London. I'm an artist as well. Um, I have quite a diverse practice, but it is mainly focused on painting, but I don't like to call myself a painter, so, uh, so I'm an artist. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, hello everyone. My name's Alistair Gordon, and I was going to call myself a painter, but <laughs> I don't know if I can. No? Uh, well, I make paintings, and I'm uh, based in London at the moment, originally from Scotland, but now working out of my studio in the centre of London. And I'm also part of a group uh, here with a chap called David McCulloch, also another Scot, part of a group called the Morphe Arts, which is a graduate network of artists in the UK, and we try to mentor and help those graduating from student life into professional creative practice. To do that with a sense of Christian integrity and professional rigor and diligence, and that's quite a new thing, Morphe Arts, as well. My name is Jonathan Anderson. Uh, most of you know me, because uh, I teach here in the art department. I've been here for six years or so. I'm an artist who makes paintings. Our, pa our panel is a little out of balance, isn't it? <clears throat> uh, and I, I think it's also worth noting that this, this conversation really is, uh, I mean, the people up here, we're pretty early on in our careers. Uh, and so we're up here speaking as people who are wrestling, not as real authorities, I don't think. We, we might be a little further on in our wrestling than some of you, but just to know, uh, we're really interested in this conversation uh, extending off of this stage. <laughs> Indeed. And um, I'm Dayton Castleman. I, am, I also do paintings, um, in addition to a variety of other things. Um, but uh, I, am, uh, I teach at Trinity Christian College, just outside of Chicago, and uh, maintain an art practice as well. Um, so um, we thought we would start um, by uh, 
getting into a type of uh, discussion about a type of space, and in this case, maybe more of an abstraction of space um, in, uh, in terms of community that um, uh, many of you and all of us up here, I think, uh, identify pretty distinctly with two communities, the one being um, the larger art world um, and the other being the ecumenical community of believers. In other words, those that, um, that, that, that find themselves, that find their identity in Christ and in that great cloud of witnesses. Um, and in a certain sense, the conversation is gonna happen if it were the Venn diagram, um, hopefully in that overlapping area to a certain degree. Um, and the way that the membranes of those two worlds that we inhabit um, are, are porous, the way that um, our, our practice and our thought um, and our, uh, our, our sort of posture within these worlds is affected by both worlds. Um, and so I wanted to actually start out by uh, asking Linnea to respond to this idea of your, um, your understanding of identity maybe within these two communities and how that works together. From here, we will actually let it become uh, organic. And um, so if, if as uh, Linnea finishes, you have a response or a thought or a question, um, we will get that ball rolling. Um, I think that before when we basically decided to start with this question, it was because um, as an artist who is a believer, there are two very different camps that lay claim to your identity. And so the space where you're allowed to be both feels rare, um, both fully, you know, and it's something you actually have to push out and discover yourself. Um, so I think that one of the things that helped me um, in my own like comfort level with this was realizing that artists were really familiar with belonging to a larger space or a larger narrative filled with really interesting people and with an inheritance of great history. So all of us go and study art history and this becomes, as an artist, part of the, your own repository. Like you, you uh, become a vessel filled up with all this information and all this great inheritance of rich visual language and ideas. and. Um, it's really an, a critical part of your education to identify with this community and with this space. But then there's also this um, preeminent identity that you have laid claim on you by Christ and by the sense of community that has a similar sort of um, resonance um, as art history, as in, um, this dynasty of great influences, the cloud of witnesses, the idea of this great narrative more or less knitting your own life and your own concerns to something greater than itself. So that in and of itself is common ground. That is a bit of that Venn diagram overlap where artists um, of faith or not of faith actually understand what it means to belong to something greater in your own practice and to be a part of a larger story. So that actually helped me um, to realize that, uh, you know, because frankly in the art world, um, to be a believer is almost to be a unicorn. And um, so it helped me to realize that this is actually more what we have in common and I can feel a little more at home and while it's true in a certain extent in that world, I am a bit of a unicorn, um, I can make a home there, you know, and assume a certain amount of familiarity. And that helps so much um, with my own stance. Instead of it being defensive or uh, leery, I can feel more at home. I think that's important work. It's easy to feel like you're the only unicorn. Yeah, but you're not. Yeah. <laughs> and not, not anymore. You may have been a unicorn. More so 30 years ago, 40 years ago. We're not as, as much a unicorn. I, I, just to follow up on that, I, I was thinking, yes, yeah, the, uh, love that. But then I, the, the, the critic in me or the problematizer in me started thinking, well, yeah, but both of those are really contested grounds. Like studying art, hist art history is a contested ground. Um, 
uh, and, uh, and the church is a contested ground. So such that I think my involvement in the church um, causes lots of, not lots, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a fairly winsome guy when it comes to <laughs> the art world. Uh, but it does, it does raise critique with me. Uh, in, in, in studying art history specifically, uh, Ben Quash was showing Caravaggio. I've sat through Caravaggio lectures in which the entire lecture is kind of a gossip session on his personal life, and there's no theology. It's like strict. Um, and and I, I get kind of irritable, and, uh, and um, it becomes contested ground, specifically because of my involvement uh, in the church. And then that also moves in the other direction, that I, I think my, my involvement in um, art and in the art world has brought certain critiques against my church and, and my churches and the church in general. So that there's, the, you sort of often feel like I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to live in one kind of world. I have some consciousness that I'm living in these two worlds, not heaven and earth, but uh, um, art world, church world. And the, the kind of movement um, and the, um, the, the critique goes back and forth. It makes things pretty complicated, pretty, pretty uh, improvisational. Yeah. Um, dovetailing on that and reflecting on something that, that you said, Linnea, you commented on the rarity of space where you're allowed to be both fully. And I think you were talking about this context when you said it. Um, in my experience, and I'm interested in you responding to this, actually, Anna. In my experience, that's not the um, experience that a lot of um, people that are invested and serious about their work as artists have, even amongst communities of Christian artists, so to speak. Um, and I'm curious if you've, what is your, do you feel like a space like this is a space where you can be, where you're allowed to be both fully or do you feel a sense of tension about that? And I think that's also a good segue into, um, because this, we, we, we create this space, so to speak, that she's talking about, and um, your own responses to that, the larger response. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is definitely a tension. Um, for me, I think what I really try not to do is separate them in my mind, because um, that is when, that's when there's a tension in terms of crossing over boundaries. Like if I see my life as that's my involvement in the art world where I don't quite fit in because I have faith in a God which no one in the art world believes in. And then that's my position in the church where I don't quite fit in because everyone thinks I do a ridiculous job uh, or it's frivolous or it, they don't understand why I do it or you know, you know, whatever. So like I could spend my time negatively dwelling on all the places where I don't fit in and feel completely isolated or I could or it's a choice isn't it to like decide whether you do that or whether you actually see that you've been one world it's all God's world you know you're part of God's church you're doing something that you believe very strongly is really important to do and you're in that world like trying to do what you want to do as well as you can do it because you believe in a God who does things incredibly well and um and so then, and, and I guess I feel like in the church I have a responsibility not to feel like I don't fit in. And because um, that's a lot about me as well as it is about the way the church makes me feel. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot about being able to be open. So I think, yeah, so it's about being open in church and being, being able to say, well, this is what my daily life is like. You know, come to my exhibitions. like. And, you know, and being supported, being able to be supported in the church like that. And then also in the art world, having the courage to be like, this is actually what makes me think, uh, what, makes, what makes me tick. And like, this is, an, this, is an, this is a big part of why I make the kind of work that I make. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of like not segregating in that way, but, it, but it's hard because, because the worlds, the worlds that, that aren't two worlds do feel yeah. very different. Um, and so it is that kind of, it's a constant struggle to make sure that you're reminding yourself that, it, that it's just one world and it's all God's.
work with, thanks, <laughs> with graduate students. And um, what, maybe you could relate a little bit some of both your own experiences and uh, the experiences that you observe with the people that you work with. Sure, thank you. Yeah, I work with graduates. I am also a graduate student, so it happens too. I'm studying towards a master's degree in fine art in London. So I'm in this quite curious position to be working with people who are just like me. I think much of this is, I think much of this concerns our perceptions. So perceptions from peers at church towards what the arts world is actually like. What do you do as a painter? What is your lifestyle? What kind of conversations are you having with other artists? and a general uh, fear and mystique that exists around the life of the, the arts and the artist. And on the other side, general perceptions of what it means to be a Christian as well. So to speak more to the latter on that, which is more, I think that's more of the issue for the graduates that we work with. Uh, at art colleges in the UK, uh, a, a Christian experience is generally equated at the moment with issues of what it means to be a sincere believer. And if you believe in something sincerely, then this is closely connected with uh, issues of fundamentalism, radicalism, and so forth. And the very nature of belief itself comes under question because of the times that we live in and the kind of atrocities that we've seen. So any discussion about religious belief comes, from my experience, from that position. Well, what are you talking about when you say you believe? Now, it seems very acceptable to discuss Christian belief from a, a detached, cool, uh, observational position to be curious about the nature of belief, to write about it, to paint about it, but to stand up and say, well, I believe sincerely, this then becomes problematic. And it's not moving from an academic curiosity or a painterly curiosity into an actual real belief that you subscribe to a certain set of values that are seen as somewhat unacceptable today. That's where the real tension comes in. I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting because um, it feels like the question is like, what's it like at graduate school? Um, and we were talking about this last night, how the intensity of it is, you know, you get to know people in, you're in this group of, of like often it's a small group of people and you're studying together for, in my case, two years and it's very intense. And actually, like, it was, it was really hard because, you know, to be a Christian in that environment because of the intensity of it. But actually there's, I find that like, that slight misunderstanding of what it means to be a Christian when I meet other artists. I feel, I feel that I don't have so much with my, with my colleagues with whom I studied on my masters because it is a unique opportunity mm -hmm. to actually live sort of alongside each other in an intense situation and so they see that, you're, that your faith isn't just something that's uh, sort of I stand up and I say I sincerely believe this and then they, they completely implant onto that all of their misconceptions or all of their ideas of what that means. Um, whereas when you when you do when you're in a kind of close contact with people and people sort of see how you live out your faith, they and also I guess see you like persevere in it. So you know, for the whole two years, I didn't suddenly give up my faith, and so my my kind of my friends are aware that like that's who Anna is, you know, and so I think that's kind of. I think I, I didn't think about that when I started my MA, and I think about it now, and I and I feel grateful. It makes me obviously wish that I had been a lot bolder and a lot clearer in so many ways. Mm. But um, I guess I think if anyone else is thinking about doing graduate school, to like see that 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 sort of double-edged, you know, like mm -hmm. the joy within the struggle, mm -hmm. um, is actually it's an it's a unique opportunity to get to know people really well and they actually, you might actually have an opportunity to show them that their perhaps preconceptions of what it means to be a Christian yeah. is perhaps yeah. wrong. I, I feel that probably in this room we have, well, I think what, what this room represents more than likely is uh, a group of people, some of whom have, may, have, uh, may have gone through the, the furnace, so to speak, um, and feel a type of dual citizenship, that we are a part of this art world, and we are a part of the kingdom of God. And I imagine in this room, we actually have people at a whole variety of places along that continuum. Uh, the voice of God's about to come back. No. <laughs> Surprising even myself. Um, so I'm interested in opening up the floor to um, comments or 
relating experiences. Uh, maybe you're an undergrad, maybe in a certain sense, you are endeavoring to earn your citizenship in that art world, and you feel very secure in your citizenship within the kingdom of God. Um, or perhaps you're coming from the other direction. Um, perhaps this community is new to you, but the other community is one that you feel comfortable with and uh, an intimate part of. Um, so let's open the floor and um, try to get this conversation rolling broadly. Yes, can you just wait one second? We have microphones that will come your way so that we can all hear. I had a question about the history of where this division or separation comes from, the, the, the world of art and faith uh, uh, as this kind of um, separated or divided worlds. Is that the iconoclastic tradition? Uh, is this a um, particularly Protestant phenomenon? Do, do Catholic artists struggle in the same way you think? So I was wondering if some of you could address that question. It's a good question. John, yeah. <laughs> That's a, it's a really complicated question. As best I understand it, it's the, the sort of, if there are divisions that happen, they happen from both sides. So there's, uh, I think, uh, as we move into the, the kind of modernist controversies, especially in the US, it's, I think, a slightly different story in Europe and elsewhere. Um, but as we move into modernist controversies, the church has all sorts of problems with uh, uh, cultural, <laughs> all sorts of cultural institutions feel threatened uh, and, and kind of withdraw, and some of that has its roots in iconoclastic um, traditions. But it also happens from the side of the art world, um, where I, th I think you have really potent critiques that are leveled against the institution of the church and the role of images in the church of from, from the kind of, uh, from the enlightenment on, but it really ramps up in early 20th century, late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, and so you, you have this, this kind of heavy critique of the institution of the church and a move towards art as being, uh, as having uh, the potential to replace religion, religious activity, so that art provides uh, experiences of the, the transcendent and the sublime independent of um, religious institutions. Um, it, it provides community and social cohesion that's sort of built around uh, one ideal or another. Uh, and and that's often accomplished by taking uh, Christian subjects in paintings and sort of demythologizing them, emptying them out, uh, or making them less specific so that a crucifixion comes to represent humanity in World War I, the suffering of, of the human person, uh, and so on. Uh, 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 Dr. Quash showed the, um, uh, the, this kind of move with the, those Salome uh, paintings and uh, the head of John the Baptist as being kind of, not really about John the Baptist, but this, this image that moves us and this story that moves us in one way or another. And so there's this uh, the kind of disengagement on the part of the art world or a critique on the part of the art world and that makes, that makes already suspicious churches even more suspicious and I think one way or another it just there's, there's a pretty dramatic split. So that I, I've actually been doing work on this, trying to find, trying to track how uh, Christians were writing about art for the first half of the 20th century especially, um, and how uh, non-Christian art critics were writing about Christian subject matter in the first half of the 20th century. And the majority of my research consists of just finding anything. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. it's the church really stopped writing about contemporary art, modern art. They had loads to say about the Renaissance and about Dutch painting and so on, but almost nothing to say about modern art. It was very much a withdrawal, and uh, it just drops out of uh, art criticism. Uh, I, I've, I've gone through index after index of these the textbooks. You can't find yeah. Christianity or religion. Uh, you get spirituality. You, you bring up art criticism, and that, um, I think, Um, that 
uh, in the very structure of higher education as it began to be transformed in the early 20th century, um, earnestly held belief on one level was seen as a threat to, um, to the freedom of inquiry that was, I think, part and parcel um, with the direction that academia was moving. Um, and uh, that, that the holding to some kind of orthodox master narrative um, was in one way, I, I think, perceived as, uh, as dishonest, or at least um, academically short-sighted. And I'm curious if there's anyone in here that uh, has had experiences within higher ed, particularly, I think, in what we would refer to as secular institutions, if there's been any, um, if there have been any experiences, perhaps even on the faculty side or something other than that, maybe we could open up the conversation in that way a little bit. I guess as you speak, you're, you're talking about uh, you know, us as Christians, which I think we all have a pretty good idea of what that means. But the, the, the question that I would like, how would you describe them? Are they primarily, if you were to say, in general, what is the belief of the ones that are not Christians? Is it primarily, would you call it materialism? Or is it specifically anything but Christianity? Or like, how would you describe those that aren't believers in the art world? And why are they so critical? I think it's really difficult to make generalizations. Uh, if, if I made any generalization, it would be anti-institutional. Most people just have a problem, I think, in, in the contemporary art world with uh, religious institutions, uh, not so much kind of spirituality or even some sort of purified uh, Christianity that might be able to function outside of an institution. Um, um, but that becomes a very privatized. There's lots of privatized spirituality, I think, in the art world. And there's lots of materialism. There's lots of everything. It's just fairly anti-institutional. I think that's where a lot of the rub comes. There's a lot of that in the church as well. Thank you. Can I just go back to where the roots are? Do the wedge for a second. Sure. Thank you. Um, I've wondered about that myself. And I think that in a particularly um, unique situation in the United States actually because a lot of the work that we looked to where there was a conflation of faith and a high degree of quality is European and um, it's interesting to note that in the United States we were founded in a pure kind of a puritanical impulse and there was a lot of rejection of image and a lot of um, focus on written word even like the idea of journaling or keeping a record of your spiritual life via words was a very strong um, kind of outflow from the founders. And uh, also there's such a pronounced lag even in um, education in the arts in the United States when we first began as a nation. Remember, we're young. <laughs> and then what happened is we ended up really surging forward in basically a visual culture, but without the stamp of the church. I don't like the word stamp. Without the influence, the like living, breathing, hopeful, creative theology of the church. Um, instead, it was so completely focused around word. Uh, and also the idea too of puritanical work ethic, a kind of like practical outcome for X number of hours, uh, kind of fed into the mill of your productivity should result in X number of pieces of productivity. Art doesn't work like that either. So it's a, you know, it's a bit of a contrast in a number of levels. Um, and I think in the United States it's particularly acute. I just wanted to add to that kind of us and them thing, which I uh, really don't like as a term. term. Um, but I guess my experience, particularly in uh, the art institution of doing a master's, um, and maybe it's because the history of art is so steeped in Christianity that the assumption is, if you're an artist today, you're anything, but you're not a Christian. And that's probably, the, you know, it's kind of the same as being not institutionalized. Um, 
but it's yeah it's that's the kind of underlying thing the kind of comments that are made the whole time are assuming that we all think Christianity is a load of rubbish right and um, and there's no chance and there's no kind of discussion for that either you know there's a that it's not even a right with a question mark it's a right move on and um, and that yeah that's I mean maybe you know of course maybe I experienced that more acutely because I go no not right <laughs> but but I think that was the underlying sense is that is that there is no us and them, just artists aren't Christians. And I think just to, sorry, just to add, add on to that, because um, the starting point for art making today, of course, isn't religious text. Um, the majority of art colleges uh, teach postmodern philosophy, and this is the starting point for art making, and, and not, not religious beliefs, so it stands to figure that the, the, our current generation of artists make work in response to what they're taught at art college. It's not a conscious, at times I think not even a conscious rejection of religious belief, but rather we read the French philosophers when we were at uni, so they're now informing the way that we're making art practice. So maybe not even a, a conscientious objection of religious belief, but just a continuation of, of, of the current way that art's taught at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's almost like various philosophies that you're taught become the sacred and the touchstones. Wow. Um, so it becomes the touchstones to kind of like gain your validity as well um, for your own practice. Say you're giving a lecture, it's really good to drop a few names to kind of like ground your work in a certain um, vein of Western thought, mostly Western thought and philosophy. So um, it's really interesting too because a lot of my friends, I, I currently live in Kansas City and um, we're very near the art school there. And uh, it's really interesting to watch uh, students uh, who come in with faith go through a lot of these philosophical classes and um, there's very little response or pushback from their worship experience to be able to deal with these really um, really fundamental questions about the way that the world is put together that are being posed for the first time to them. Um, and, I, and so I think that uh, holding on, and more than that, actually thriving and flourishing as a believer in your faith is something that uh, was well nigh uh, miraculous because there's very little support for that. Um, but uh, as far as like the us, them thing, I think that that thinking is actually pretty dangerous and uh, it's incredibly helpful to remember the words of Jesus <laughs> and times when we're tempted to think that way, that each one of us is hopelessly lost without him and no different than a person who hasn't surrendered basically and um, his love is equal, you know, and uh, compassion. Um, is an imaginative act that is able to go into another person and understand and see yourself in them or attempt to, you know, go ahead and imagine the confines of their life and what it's like. So Jesus did that. Jesus was able to, he was very, in, yeah, divine insight certainly, but he was intelligent and imaginative and could look at where someone's needs were and all that sort of thing. And, you know, it's just not any different in the art world. Um, in some ways, it's more hostile, but it's just the same. Let me push back a little bit. Um, and by saying that, um, I agree um, on, uh, on, an, on an abstract level, um, but one of the experiences that I, that I had while I was in graduate school is that I did not see the same people on Sunday mornings that I saw the rest of the week. In other words, there was a distinct spatial um, separation when I was in the basement of the Art Institute of Chicago, I was not seeing the same people as when I was in Covenant Presbyterian Church. Um, so that, no, what I mean is literally the same people. In other words, the communities didn't overlap, but both were important to me. Um, and uh, I'm interested in as well that I discovered that I, I received certain sustenance in one arena and certain sustenance in the other arena. And I longed for an arena where the, these types of settings, where it feels like, oh, you know, I'm being sustained 
and my whole person is being engaged, like what you addressed at first. So I'm interested, both of you, have, you know, are pretty adamant about this separation is artificial. We create these artificial divisions in our head um, that are unhealthy. And on one level, I believe that's true. On another level, I also believe that it's just the way that it is because I don't run into the same people. Maybe you could address that or revise your comments based on that. And then I also want to definitely get, you had your hand up, we have a couple. Let's uh, get the conversation out onto the floor. It, it, to be really rude, can I respond for them? <laughs> <laughs> or, yes, you can. Or in their place. Yes. Because, uh, uh, yeah, or first. Or first. Um, <laughs> respond to that question, anyway. I, I, I do agree that the, the us-them uh, combative uh, framing of the issue is, is no good, really problematic, and does no good. I think I went into graduate school with this kind of combative sense, and it was unchristian, and it was awful. Uh, don't be combative. For the love of God, <laughs> don't, don't be combative. Um, because it's not us them, it's not two people groups or whatever. I think the, the way to understand the, the issue that we're trying to get at is that it's two discourses that have been divorced from each other for a long time. Hmm. So they don't use the same vocabulary, or if they do, they mean totally different things. They have different histories, they have different things they're talking about, almost entirely. And it's not just a disciplinary uh, distinction, you know, that engineering talks in a different language than mathematics. Well, that's similar. Engineering and literature. literature. It's not just that, but there, it's a different, there's a different well that you're drawing from. There's a different picture of the world. It's a different discourse. So it's not us and them. It's two different discourses. And they're not both. Uh, one isn't necessarily all good, one necessarily all bad. Uh, I, I kind of happen to like French philosophy, actually, uh, in a lot of ways. I think there's a lot of real good and real virtue in the art world discourse. The problem is what uh, Dayton was getting at was that you feel like you're having to translate between two different languages and discourses that aren't communicating with each other. So I find one of the strains on my practice is that I spend a lot of time reading art criticism and theory and a lot of time reading theology and, uh, and there are beginning to be a kind of raft of books that are trying to be theology of art or theological aesthetics. I think there's great work being done in that arena, but it's really only been in the last 20 years, 30 years is the sort of start of it. 19, late 70s is when you start getting um, some people uh, who are trying to talk between these two discourses. Um, but really, it tends to either be I, either um, um, theologians who have an okay understanding of contemporary art or contemporary artists who have an okay understanding of theology, but there's not a strong, a strong, um, uh, there aren't strong examples of people who can speak in both of those discourses simultaneously. I think that's, that's our issue. It's not us and them. It's yeah. discourses and histories. Let's let Anna respond, and then we'll go to this gentleman. Who's okay, well, that's, I mean, it might be discourses, but I think the point is, if you're, if you're striving to be in, like, if you understand the discourse of the art, and you understand, you know, theological discourse, then even though they may be separate, like, um, uh, geographically, within you, there's one discourse. It's a synthesis. And, uh, and that's the point. And like, and I, I don't know, I just think that, you know, okay, I understand that when you're at Chicago, the Art Institute of Chicago, you didn't see the same face, literally the mm -hmm. same faces yeah. that you saw at church. But in the same way, I mean, I know this is a bit silly, but in the same way, there are plenty of Christians who go to different churches and I don't see their faces at my church. Like, you, you know, that's, you know, you kind of, you've kind of got to remind yourself that you can think about this as separated terms, or you can think about it as it actually is, and that is one discourse, one world, one people, one God. Like, and then, and then you've got to engage with it, in, and like in the same way, I think it is because this world is so huge. Like, there's natural segregations. There is the art world. There's the world of literature. You know, we, there could be a completely different symposium somewhere else happening right now, full of doctors, and I would be a complete fish out of water there. But like. You know, that's kind of, 
we do that because we learn from, we can understand things by being specialists, but at the same time, we're being specialists in the context of a wider world, which, to be honest, is why, this is a silly thing, but it's why I don't call myself a painter. Like, it's because I see my work within the context of the art world, within the context of art, and within the context of being an artist. No different to someone who makes sculpture, someone who makes video work, yeah. and it's a big, it's a big deal for me because I don't want to create that segregation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I was on my master's course, I heard people say, "I'm not going to go to that exhibition because I make paintings and that's sculpture." Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's problematic. Yeah. It's it's not helpful and and it's isolated and it's it takes you down a dangerous path of silliness. I'm interested in, uh, I think that there's a, there's a structural issue as well because the, 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 the discourse of art history is built around categorization, is a, built around making distinctions. So there's a, almost a systemic um, uh, artificial delineation of things um, that, uh, that, that goes on. I don't want to like, continue in that vein right now, but it's an interesting thought. Um, you had your hand up and then I saw someone over here and I want to hear, was it you, Jeremiah? Okay, a response and then, uh, Brett. It, Hold on just a second. Is this mic on? It is my personal belief. Christian now, and uh, I'm not an artist, I'm a businessman, I go into the marketplace with, I do, you know, products and serve you guys into the marketplace with art, a Christian world, and so I think that's the, the tension that we uh, feel when we go in there. I think Christianity is, is like a remnant now. Uh, we understood and believe in what happened 2,000 years ago. The rest of the people don't. And uh, they, uh, the entire civilization is built on Christianity, but the people living in it don't understand where it came from. So I think that's the disconnect that, that we feel. But I love art because I believe that uh, it was art and images that uh, you know, Christians gathered for images and sacrament, not word and sacrament, because most people were illiterate. Uh, most people didn't read. They didn't have the printing press until recently. It was only, it's a recent phenomenon that Christians gather for word and sacrament. But I think for the majority of the time, it was image and the arts and the artists and all that stuff for, for a thousand years was, uh, I think, very important to, to contribution to what we have today. And it's important that we remember it because I think the rest of the culture doesn't. Thank you. Um, Jeremiah. Um, I think we can all agree that we, that a Christian didn't uh, design these microphones. Clearly, um, clearly. I don't believe what? I don't believe tension is bad, but I don't think you do either. And I was wondering if you could more comment on how the tension that you've lived in in these environments has actually refined your work yeah. and maybe refined how you articulated your whole life. That, that's, that was my very next point where I was like kind of bursting to get out and talk about because um, the fact is, you know, we do have this divorce situation and it's actually an incredibly rich moment because tension creates a kind of electricity, both positive and negative kind of charge. And one of the most uh, invigorating things for me is attempting to build bridges to kind of like swing across the divide and create understanding between one and the other. It's incredibly creative space. So I actually see my work as an attempt at that. Um, this gap is actually uh, a great opportunity because and I, going off of your comment, you're talking about an image culture um, that actually uh, injected theology into a visual medium because a lot of people weren't literate for many, gen you know, well, hundreds of years. We have experienced a long run of literacy and a civilization that was based off word, and a lot of the work of theology has been done in a word-based system. However, in the last 30 years, 
we have become a lot more visual, and I would dare to say less literate, mm -hmm. perhaps on the verge of illiteracy in some areas. Yeah. So that's actually an incredibly interesting moment because the work of theology is mostly verbal. So now, and you were talking about this advent of this new raft of books and people attempting, uh, perhaps in a stumbling sort of way, to try and understand uh, theology through art. And there's a reason for that, because the culture is shifting and moving and changing. Mm -hmm. And so this is a really great opportunity for artists of belief to go in and make excellent work that um, because art comes from a really, well, almost from the biblical sense of the word, like bowels, the bowels of who you are, what you believe, and if we actually believe that we've been changed in a new creature, then the work that we make will inherently carry the essence of Christ, life or death. And it's an attempt to visually um, occupy that gap. And that's a really, like what you were talking about, tension being good, it's a very good moment, especially now. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Um, Brent. Or? Uh, oh, sorry. No, not at all. Go okay. ahead. Um, my observation of the church would be that there has been a pretty severe truncation of the theology of the soul, that it seems like artists have been able to reclaim. And I'm curious what your experience as artists has, um, has given you as far as insight into that understanding of the soul that maybe most people aren't learning at church or in Sunday school or maybe even in the seminary. I, it's something that I've given a, quite a bit of thought to myself. Um, you, what you're talking about is the, um, this idea that we, we, we would like to truncate this idea of body and spirit. And we would like to try to create a division between the two. Um, I, it parallels these um, divisions that we talk about in a sense, or, or, or maybe it, it even um, uh, serves as a type of seed for these truncations between sacred and secular, between you know, our life as Christians, our life as artists. Um, and that um, in fact, you know, as we understand scripturally, um, we, are, we are one person, body and soul in this, um, uh, undissolvable solution, so to speak, um, and integration. And um, I, I, I really like what you said, Linnea, in that sense that um, I believe that we can, that part of believing and trusting the work of the Holy Spirit is our ability to make work unselfconsciously um, Assuming and trusting that it will, in fact, um, reflect our adoption. Um. Um, one thing I'd like to say in addition to that um, is because you can make work and feel free when you actually believe that piece of theology. Free to explore the world around you, explore how it is that you're made and what you're interested in and uh, you don't have to feel especially constrained to a certain set of symbols in order to be true to what you say you believe with your lips. You can do so also with your medium, whatever it may be. The other thing I think that's interesting is that as an artist, as far as understanding the soul, there's, I had this revelation a couple months ago about the word incarnation and the action of it, um, because as an artist, I take, I take some sort of half-formed fleeting hunch and or unction, um, a whiff of a thing, an idea, and I have to have a lot of faith that it might work out in order to put a lot of resources behind it. But then the other thing, and this is the really miraculous thing, and part of the reason that we're addicted to doing this thing, is because it gives you a high and you can't believe it just happened. But you take something that was in the ether, that was an idea, something that didn't yet, doesn't yet occupy the world, and you give it body. You incarnate it in some way. 
we are involved in the experience of incarnation, which, I mean, the moment I realized that, I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> you know, this is, this is an amazing reality that I have the privilege of somehow being outfitted with, by no merit of my own, the natural desire to uh, hone talents, some of which were just given to me, that allow me to experience what incarnation might feel like. And um, so as far as like soul and what you were saying about being wedded with body, it, it feels something that become like something I'm familiar with because I'm someone who makes things. Um, and that thingness from an abstraction, mm -hmm. I think is deeply spiritual, has everything to do with the soul has everything to do with what it means to be a believer, and um, is something I feel is uh, sacred about being an artist. And every artist who makes, and most smart artists make, not all of them do, but most, understands, and that's part of what I'm talking about with, there's a lot of common ground. There's a lot of overlap, so. Yeah. Um, give Brent the mic here. Um, th this is maybe going to circle back around to what we were saying before. Okay. I think this is just how these things go, right? Um, so I, I was going to actually double down on the notion of, of, uh, of the us versus them dialectic being problematic in that I, I'm not so sure, like if we're talking about the contemporary art world, I'm not so sure if those distinctions really actually exist. Like the, the notion of them, like who is them, um, the... The art world is mostly a commercial enterprise. I mean, where the, the this this symposium is happening on a on a college campus, and so uh, the purview of this setting is certainly the world of ideas. But most of the power players, those who make the important decisions in the art world, uh, are commercial dealers or commercial people with commercial interests, and so. I don't know. I mean, everybody loves a unicorn, you know? Mm -hmm. um, what's not to love about a unicorn? And yeah. so it's, it's in, a, in a way, it's kind of like, it's a matter of uh, if these distinctions uh, exist at all, it's a, it's, um, it's a matter of, I think, making good on, on those decisions, using those as a real springboard to, find, to establish a kind of distinction mm -hmm. in your voice. Yeah, scripture commands us to be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. And in my experience, I have discovered on a number of occasions that uh, my, uh, the novelty of my unicornness is actually an engendered opportunity that I may not have had for engagement within the dialogue that involves the church and the, and the culture of art. Um, I'm curious if maybe um, some of you guys would come. We haven't heard from you for a bit um, about that your experience as someone who, in a, even in a professional sense, is engaged in the activity of discipleship and whatnot with artists of faith while being a graduate student. So you must be like, you're a super unicorn in a certain sense, or a very public one, yeah. Super unicorn, I'll put that on my CV, that's quite good. I, I think this point is excellent, and the majority of the arts are run by as a, as a commercial enterprise. It really is a commercial enterprise. But there's something of a disconnect between those who are buying and selling paintings and those who are learning to become painters at art school. That the kind of discussion that we're having here, what is the nature of belief, the relationship between theology and philosophy, these are the kind of discussions that you have at a graduate level, and less so, I think, as you advance on in your career. And it's slightly cynical, but um, a well-known fact, I think the majority of people who buy art are, are well off. And if they're well off, they probably aren't artists, and they probably didn't go to art school, and they probably didn't go to theological college either. So their, their motivation for buying work is somewhat different from the discussion that the artwork might embody in, in some way. That being said, at the graduate level, uh, art schools are full of people who are wanting to talk about stuff and have ideas and are fascinated by life in general and want to have this conversation and therein lies the opportunity, therein lies the Christian engagement. Of course, not to say 
there's no Christian engagement at the commercial end of the market because we need to, let's pray for God-fearing art dealers and collectors and buyers and those who might engage with Christian integrity in the corpus of the commercial art scene. But further down the run at graduate school, there are opportunity to talk about French philosophy. How does that connect with what we understand in terms of Christian belief and so forth? And then from a mentoring point of view, in, in Morphe Arts we find uh, a lot of students have come through art college and have had a real love of painting taken out of them by art school. A real love and enthusiasm for art making that's been somewhat robbed from them. And maybe they've been instilled with this ambition and enthusiasm to paint or make art because they see that as part of their God-given human experience. Just the general Christian experience of engaging with his world and, and making work as a, a child of God. And when that's pushed out of you at art school, a need perhaps to, cynically speaking, to justify or qualify what you're making, professionally speaking, to, to push towards a real rigor of thinking in, in what you're doing, that we find often a lot of people come out of art college and kind of a bit of a, a gibbering wreck and needing to put the pieces back together again, a reinstillment in the love of making art and seeing that as something that's valuable in God's kingdom. Um, someone had their hand up over here. Do you? And just before we hear from this person, uh, I want to say that this is actually a way of making a good segue into another topic which is putting food on the table and continuing to do what you feel called to do by God, which is a significant challenge. And I think that's the way we will, we, it's called making it, right? Um, maybe we'll shift the conversation after a short break um, soon um, to the nuts and bolts, a little bit like how have we actually gone about, how have you gone about trying to make this happen and what are the challenges and problems that you encounter in the process? Yes. Before we get to that point, I have a, uh, yeah. a question. Um, and it's, it, it's a little different than buying and selling. What I'm wondering is if Christian artists actually have a responsibility similar to, say, a theologian um, to be teaching Christians about the kingdom of God in a way that written word could not, but instead experience can only teach. Uh, I think of the way that Christ spoke of the kingdom of, the, of God in parables. Um, is there something similar that Christian artists as servants should be teaching us uh, that written word could not? Uh, there's teaching, and then what you said, which is interesting, is do we have a responsibility to teach? Is that what I'm picking up on, in other words? Yeah, it, to, to pull that together, that you guys are able to create a medium in which, say, Thomas Aquinas couldn't, uh, that you are able to create something beautiful that can teach our souls about God in a different way than, you know, the Maybe I'll respond world. a little bit yeah. uh, to that. Um, I don't want to over, I don't want to turn the artist's task into something overly noble, in that, that we all have responsibility to teach one another about the attributes of God. But perhaps the way that the artist demonstrates that is somewhat different from how other peers at church might do that. Maybe that's connected in some way to talking about the non-tangible, non-visible attributes of the world that we see around about us, to see that manifest in an object, as Linnea was putting really quite succinctly. But to talk about, move that on towards our responsibility to do that, I can imagine most of my painting mates going, oh, give us a break. You know, we just want to make some stuff, make some, some paintings. So I wouldn't want to put pressure on the artist to do that, but perhaps the Christian artist has an alternative way of seeing the world that might be of intrigue, interest, perhaps teach something to peers at church. Would you like a follow-up question? Can I add to that? Yes, you may. Um, it's interesting, um, just the whole kind of, I know it's sort of terminology, but the idea of like an artist's responsibility to teach, I, I sort of have a problem with that. Like I feel like that word like didactic is, if ever that's applied to an artwork, it's a negative thing. Um, because, because I don't, I don't, like that would almost make the work quite kind of like readable and flat. And I think, you know, some, some of the things that Ben was talking about in his talk about some of the um, works that we were looking at, that were picking out things that you wouldn't necessarily pick out straight away, or that, you know, subtly referring to the, an idea of the Trinity in a way that you wouldn't expect. And that's where you see the imagination of the artist, and that's where you see, like, depicting something that can't be, can't be taught in a way. It's, you're getting a sense of it through an image that's very different to someone standing up and teaching. And I guess 
So in that way, I, I wouldn't put that responsibility on myself to teach um, because I don't think that's not what my work is doing because I think that there are people who are given the responsibility to teach and that is literally teaching. Uh, I think there's a different kind of um, exploration that happens in making art that, that can be informative, that can inspire minds which could look like the same response that someone gets when they're being taught. You know, someone could be taught and they could be inspired and someone could look at artwork and they could be inspired but I think it's a different kind of thing. Uh, absolutely, and that's, that's kind of what I was driving at, isn't so much of teaching, say, allegorically through your art, but actually uh, crafting something that can allow someone to enter into an experience um, that can really, I think, form the soul in a different way than just an intellectual conversation. Yeah. I think Nick Wolterstorff's work is actually really helpful on this point. Uh, art in action, the main argument as I take it is that uh, art doesn't do one thing, it does lots of things. Um, in it, it, depending on, um, well, it, depending on what it's supposed to do in a given social situation. Art is a, is a social, it performs social actions. And there are a multitude, I think, of actions that art can perform. Um, one of the things that it can perform well, I think, is visual spatial thinking. Um, uh, that we think through uh, meanings, meaningfulness in the world, meaningfulness in, of uh, um, human relationships and conceptual relationships through visual and spatial relationships. So I do think that art is a kind of thinking. I don't know that it's very good at teaching things or communicating very well. I, don't, I just don't know that it does that very well. Not nearly as, like, which is why we're not up here painting because it, it, pa painting is, uh, yeah? I mean, it, it would be great, it would just be something totally different. Do you want to open that can of worms? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think it would be, I think, mm -hmm. I think painting, I think art making yeah. is, is a way of thinking, but not, uh, not a great way of communicating always. Although there are, there are design. Um, you know, I think Jesus is a good example. <laughs> That's a Sunday school answer for you. Um, Jesus was a, was, was a person that I believe was creative in the way he lived his life, top to bottom. That there was imagination involved in every aspect of the way that Jesus lived. One dimension of that imagination of his involved a particular art form, and that art form was storytelling. And the one consistent characteristic of Jesus' storytelling, the one thing that could be said to be consistent across the board, was that nobody got it. <laughs> Every once in a while somebody got it, but generally speaking, if you could draw one conclusion, is that Jesus did not tell stories to teach. He did not practice his art form in a sense to teach, but I think it was to make people think and to excite imaginations and to create paradoxical relationships in their head, to problematize divisions and um, to undermine assumptions, in fact. Um, but the one thing that Jesus' stories did not do well was um, communicate propositionally. Um, he did communicate propositionally, um, but it, there was a, there's a distinction when he was doing one or another, I think. Um, I, I think, think that all of these things that we're talking about, the, uh, the things that we've been talking about, and if we shift toward a more practical, in terms of how do we sustain our practices as artists, how do we nourish those practices as artists? How do we um, sustain our, um, our faith and nourish our faith? Um, and how do we live while doing it? Our part of an inseparable whole. Um, and it's not an easy one to navigate because we are in a sense, um, compelled to be both navigators um, that uh, we, our practices have um, direction, um, but we also have to sail a ship. We also have to raise and lower those sails. We have to work the till um, and keep the thing afloat in order that we can flesh out um, these things that we're talking about. I imagine that in this audience we've got represented a lot of different stories as to how this happens. Um, I would guess that there are some people in the audience that um, have some regrets, perhaps. Um, because of the way that um, they're, perhaps they've lost the ability in a certain sense to 
continue working as artists. Um, and, um, and we've got some that don't have any sense of barrier or clue. Um, let's hear briefly from panelists about it first, and then open the floor. As we get into this, it's more likely that we'll get into narrative, that we'll begin to hear people's stories. And the one, um, I think, danger in that is that those things can kind of run on. So if, if there has to be a little bit more um, uh, deliberate uh, cutting off or wrangling, we'll do that in love. But uh, let's, let's, go, let's go ahead. <laughs> Whichever order you prefer. Anna. Well, I guess, I mean, it is very hard. And I think the hardest part about it is that there is no one path. That, like, in another, in another job, you know, I, I know friends who, who do normal jobs and they get, uh, they get undergraduate scheme and then they get on. You know, it's, and it literally is, you're going from one job to the next, and each time you'll get paid more, and, you know, and that's, that's normal life. Like, that's what you should expect, so that by the time you're older, you're earning more, and so therefore you can live a different kind of life to what you lived when you were 21, and, you know, and that's what people expect. Unfortunately, it does not work like that, to be an artist, and even, you know, even, I guess I would say that looking at my situation now, Probably looks like I'm doing really well, but it's still, it's still constantly this this feeling of like, yeah, uh, I might I might have to work in a shoe shop again uh, in a couple of months' time, and and the problem with with my situation is that is that because I've trained myself only in being an artist, it doesn't really qualify you to get a good job. So I can go back to working in a shoe shop, but I did that when I was 16, and then you know. And obviously, the, the, way, the wage you get paid in a shoe shop is, in England is the minimum wage, so to earn enough to live, you need to work loads of hours, and suddenly you hardly have an art practice anymore. So it's very problematic. Um, and I would say, I would also say that one of the biggest things that I've had to learn is that being an artist isn't just about being an artist, it's about being an administrator, kind of a businesswoman. <laughs> Like you have to, you have to sort of really learn all these other skills that I don't think many other professions require you to learn. Um, and yeah, so that's that's tricky as well. Which is also why I just like to say that I cringe slightly about sitting here in a table that, uh, on a <coughs> discussion that's called making it. Uh, <laughs> it's quite awful. You could, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or limping along. <laughs> making it up. That is how it feels. Yes, making it up. And with aplomb. Yes, with confidence. So, uh, I would say that in my case, I just made a very early recognition that in order to be an artist, one of my primary goals would be to buy back my time. That time was one of the biggest mediums that was were necessary to get myself in the studio was just the studio. Um, and so the way it worked out for me is uh, after grad school, uh, I made some pretty counterintuitive decisions as far as career goes. And that's because I became a believer as an adult in grad school. Mm, interesting. And uh, then, so then I decided I wanted to go to a version of Bible school. And for four years, I worked in my studio in the attic uh, and went to day classes and didn't have another job and basically just became progressively poorer and poorer, would sell pieces occasionally. And um, then in this journey of faith, uh, ended up, I just made a couple packs with myself. I would save as much money as I could, but I would also... Um, make it my priority to be making work as much as I possibly could. And that meant that I made decisions about how I ate, how I dressed, <laughs> how I, you know, a lot of just really practical nuts and bolts kinds of things. Um, and interestingly enough, um, and I think actually this is pretty important, when I would get panicked about this ridiculous thing that I was doing, um, my parents actually believed in me more than I believed in myself a lot of times. And I think that they often knocked sense into my head and said, 
you may feel panicked about this or that right now, but we actually can see your identity through your fear. And you actually, like, as you pursue your identity, a lot of these other things will fall into place. So I don't want to paint any kind of um, erroneous picture that doesn't include the element of fear and having to take care of that, kind of like face it. Um, but I would say that persistence in the face of that and then also just running into it um, has shown me that I need to be an artist and it will eventually yield and it has yielded. Just take some time. So um, also I did, I did buy a house, which I live in Kansas City. Very smart move, uh, actually. I didn't know it when I was doing it. I did it for different reasons. But it actually helped to stabilize because I, I'm able to rent it out and have a community there. Um, and it's helping to uh, create a good lifestyle for a lot of young single women. And um, it's actually helping me, like I always have somewhere to go to where there's a roof over my head, which just matters psychologically to me. So just some clues, personal bits of information, because very few people uh, do that. They kind of like gloss over them or just gloss over that. So there you go. Yeah, I think this is a very important question, and thank goodness we got to it. It's one thing to talk about being an artist, it's one thing to, to work and make that happen. And one thing that they won't tell you at art college is how to be an artist. They might tell you what to say or how to look like an artist, but how to actually work and make a living from what you do is oddly missing from the art education system field. And the assumption is that you graduate from art college and the thing is to to buy some work and you made for life. Of course, well, that does happen to some people, and it doesn't necessarily make you up for life, but for the majority of us, this just doesn't happen. So how then do you survive and how do you cope? It's imperative that you make a plan. It sounds very dull, and even a little too pragmatic, but sit down and imagine where you might want to be in five years' time, even in ten years' time. I think how you might get there. Which artists are currently there at the moment? Do you have their numbers? Can you get in touch with them? Can you ask them how do you get to the point that you're at now? The chances are, as the girls have said already, that they're good at their administration, that they're good at organising themselves. They might not necessarily even be the best kind of artist, but they know how to handle themselves in terms of business. There are some very helpful websites that can help you put together a package uh, CV, and to help you put together proposals for artists, uh, uh, their galleries and projects and so on. I know that UK ones, I'm afraid I don't know what the American equivalents are, but there's a lot of help out there online. It's very important to make a plan. If, you, if you're trying to make a living, you need to know how much money your artwork generates. So if you've got a studio rent, you've got materials, travel expenses, you might have to get tax breaks off that, so the tax to talk to the tax people as soon as you graduate and find out what your tax breaks are going to be. As you're devising your plan, work out how much money you spend a month. Um, what are your outgoings? And then you know how much money you need to earn. So are you selling a painting to generate that income? And the chances are as a graduate you're not, so you might just find a part-time job. So what part-time job can you get that will help you facilitate your art practice? Do you want the kind of job that you can just go and do, you can kind of switch your brain off, if you can get for the studio? Or do you want a, a, a job that will somehow inform what you're doing in the studio? As in, would you like to work for a gallery? Or uh, would you like to work for a, a website that deals with artistic matters? Would you be an apprentice for an artist? Um, but work out how much money you're going to need to come in and find an income that helps you with that. All these things are terribly, terribly dull, but absolutely essential for any artist. And um, I think it's important as well to get your work out there. So look for competitions and art prizes. What are you going to enter? Don't just sit around in the studio hoping about how nobody sees your work. Once you're getting your work out to people, lo and behold, no one's going to come and see your work. So enter competitions, enter prizes. Put A1 for any of your artists that have a website these days. And print out cards so that when you meet someone in an interesting gallery, you can give them your card. Would you like to have a look at my website, perhaps we can even talk about my work at some point in the future. These kind of things, it's a kind of business style uh, mind. And 
That's why I'm going on the law, I'm going to be passionate about this. Uh, an important, of course, of prayer. Prayer, 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 prayer. Our, our Lord wants to count us on a thousand hills. And uh, a career in the arts is not the only capacity. And I've certainly found the opportunities that I've received in recent years has come through meeting people that I might not expect to meet or being involved with exhibitions that I really wouldn't have imagined being involved with or engineered myself but just the people that goes born into my life in particular circumstances. And that just comes by his divine intervention. So prayer is the aim. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I, I think, uh, I, I, I want to reiterate that um, uh, it's, you don't really learn about this in art school, uh, unfortunately. Uh, I'm 34, I know I look like 24. Um, I'm 34, I feel like I've only started understanding this stuff in the past three years, two, three years. And it's been sort of trial and error. Um, and I think I, uh, I'll point out a couple of pivotal uh, ideas that have been helpful for me. The first was already mentioned, and I'll just restate it, uh, that um, you have to you, you have to have some conception of a holistic artistic practice. Where the, I, I for a long time operated under the uh, idea that when I was actually making paintings, I was working as an artist, and all of the other stuff was an extraordinary annoyance that I had to deal with um, uh, taxes and budgets and uh, uh, all of these things. Um, uh, even the emails, the connections, the communication, like all of that didn't count. And certainly what didn't count was my reading practices and my art viewing practices and all of that. I, I think if you're gonna make it as an artist, all of that has to be artistic practice or your life is a fragmented mess and uh, you're never, you're, there's no coherence. Um, so I, I think that has been really helpful. When, uh, and you need to be disciplined and, and uh, go about it with a plan, but all of, this, all, all of this has to fit together, and you're doing this as part of your practice, and this as part of your practice for intentional reasons. I, I think that's really important. Um, secondly, I think, I think uh, um, the, uh, it's, it's helpful for me to take long range, have, have long range patience. I think we, we have a kind of infatuation with making it young and quick, and it's um, uh, counterproductive, I think. It discourages us really quickly, and it leads to impatient uh, work and bad decisions. <laughs> I think uh, giving yourself the, um, the time to develop and, and, and that, you know, uh, hopefully I'll be doing something really interesting uh, when I'm starting around, you know, 60. Uh, maybe at that point I, I'll kind of be doing something interesting. In the meantime, I need to always be grappling with it and, and, and fighting with it and certainly figuring out how to make a living and all of those things. But uh, uh, that impatience is a real problem for me. Uh, it, 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 I've gradually become more, more patient. I think that's important. Because uh, you have to have patience, uh, because it, it takes 10 years just to get to know your way around in the art world, I think. Um, and that brings me to another point, not to run on and on. Um, but I, I think there's, there, it's very common for artists to be embittered about the commercial art world, um, and to be embittered about, it's, you know, it's about who you know, and blah, blah, blah. That's usually a sign that whoever's saying that doesn't understand how things work, unfortunately. I, because when I said those things, uh, I didn't understand what I was talking about. Because um, I, think, I think all of that stuff, yeah, there are problems with the commercialization of art, and yeah, there are problems with the way that the art world works. It's full of shenanigans. It's full of uh, all sorts of shenanigans in terms of finance and all of that. But all of that just has to do with the fact that the art world is fundamentally a social sphere. It's a social activity. And anytime you get people together, of course there's going to be, um, um, the whole thing runs based on who you know. Everything runs based on who you know. This is running based on who you know, one way or another. 
because it's social. Art is social. Um, and so uh, that's an encouragement to um, even bring your kind of interactions with, not, I, I don't mean instrumentally, but that uh, your investment into a community of people, that you see your activity as an artist, as investing into a community of people, uh, and furthering other people, and generating conversation, and those sort of things, that's how the whole, the whole thing goes around. Um, and I, I, I have one other thing to say about studio space. I know I'm rambling. It's okay. Um, um, but I, I've also grown to, to regard the studio space, cultivating space for the making of art as really important. Um, it, such that uh, I start to view the studio, and increasingly viewing the studio, as a, a, a space that I construct and very intentionally organize to be to facilitate artistic practice and to facilitate the social practice. I mean, sometimes we don't understand that, you know, when people come into your studio, they're not really coming to look at your work, primarily. They're coming to um, meet you. <laughs> it, it, like, if, if you have a gallery director or a curator coming into your studio, they're not coming to look at your work. They can look at your work online. Um, they're coming to see how you organize your life, how you organize your time and your space, because you're going to be a, a potential um, business partner, a friend. Uh, it's, it's the equivalent of inviting someone into your office or into your home. Or something like that. It's the professional space. It's the space where you make the work. And it's a, it's a, it's a, a space where you uh, in, in, invite people in and generate conversation. I'd say there was some amalgamation between the studio visit, getting to know you, and looking at the work. Um, Certainly, yeah. But it's not primarily, like, if, if, if a gallery director comes to your studio and it's a total disaster, mm -hmm. they're, they're paying attention. I, I've talked to several gallery directors who are like, I don't know why these artists uh, don't realize that I'm coming to look at how they organize their space. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm investing a whole month of overhead, potentially, on them. If they can't organize their studio space, I'm not going to work with them. Don't care what they are. Um, let's, uh, I'm going to say something, and then we're going to open up to the floor, but hang on to this, because I'm sure it'll come back around. <laughs> um, I'll never forget my first day of uh, formal art education. Uh, I was a freshman. It was the first day of class, and my professor, John Willington, said to our entire class of freshmen, in no uncertain terms, he looked us in the eye and he said, if there's anything in the world that you can imagine doing besides art, you should change your major and go do that. Because it's just too hard to do unless you're that committed to it. Um, and I was just too, uh, I think, immature and ignorant to, um, I didn't know myself well enough to know that I didn't really actually have any kind of uh, solidified commitment to art, but I couldn't imagine doing anything else at that moment. Um, I certainly wasn't going to be a math major. Um, and uh, so I stuck with it, and I was, at best, I would say, um, a, an immature art student. Um, I graduated in the uh, summer of 1997, and I didn't make any art until the middle of April 1998, so it was almost a year after I graduated. Um, and I think that was a time of reflection, a time of um, trying to understand myself. Um, but I never stopped. As of April 1998, I've never stopped making things. And I resonated with your uh, comment about addiction, um, that I discovered this kind of internal drive. And what I also discovered was that um, making it was a matter of survival. It felt uh, like a survival instinct to just figure it out. And when it's all you've got, when you put all your eggs in that basket, as you say, we're not, uh, uh, we're not broadly practically trained, generally speaking. There are not a lot of jobs we can actually do in this sense. Um, and, uh, you know, and then 10 years later, I discovered myself uh, in our professor. Um, and, uh, and then I, I just recently resigned that position. 
um, you know, the, coveted, the coveted uh, tenure track, you know, full time art position. And um, I sense that uh, adventure, inquiry, and exploration was uh, more important than I think maybe in a certain sense that was part of the survival instinct. I, I wanted my art work to remain robust. And um, if you've done it for 10 or 11 years, your, uh, your, 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 your uh, tolerance for risk um, can develop as well. And I think that's one of the keys is developing a tolerance for how much are you willing to risk on this thing. But I'd like to open the floor um, to, to, to you guys and, and to um, I, I, I'd be especially interested in hearing from artists or non-artists, in a certain sense, that are older than we are, um, that have been around the block a few more times, and, and perhaps your experience is that maybe you no longer make work, but you did once, and you regret that, um, or maybe you're continuing to do it, or maybe you have developed a practice that's self-sustaining, um, invigorating, so on and so forth. So um, let's broaden the conversation. Hi, um, I'm a graduating art senior and um, three months until the big day. Um, I, I know that this is a kind of a personal question, but I know that talking to other art seniors, we, we fear that we're not going to be artists one day, as well as we fear that we're going to be losing the artist community and how much we're very much attached to the artist community. How do you find the community with other artists outside of grad school, outside of university? Let's hear another, maybe someone from the floor can respond first to that as well. Anyone? Yeah. Hi. Um, I just finished my MFA recently, and I think some of the answer is it's um, I mean, I think when you get involved in any kind of specified community, you find that it's a lot smaller than you think looking on the outside. So as an undergrad or as an artist um, just going into it, which I am still, um, I think you look in and it seems like you'll never be able to get in. That's about just breaking in. But really it's just about, I don't know, meeting and communicating and the more kind of openings and the more events like this that you go to and the more community that you with um, fellow artists and fellow students, um, I think it's, it's easy to have community. And I think that it's all around you, and it's easy to, you know, LA is a huge place, but it's a pretty small arts community. And I find that if I go to something, I know, um, you know, a large percentage of those people, and if I don't, we have common ground to, um, you know, open a discussion and, and enter into a community. It's a very generationally um, uh, nested response. Because I know for a fact um, that 30 years ago, 40 years ago, there were many artists um, that could not, by a long shot, repeat that sentiment, that they felt a profound sense of isolation, and that perhaps they were the only unicorn. Um, and imagine some of those are in the room, um, wondering if uh, we could hear some of those voices. I would say that a day job is not a bad thing because it has allowed me to create work that I otherwise would not have been able to afford to, uh, to make. And in a couple of years, I'll be retiring and I will be able to continue to work at the same level that I've been working at for the last 20 years. And if your art is that important to you, you will create your art, and you may or may not have a community, per se, that you might have had in, in, in college. Uh, but those people that truly resonate with you and your work, you, you will come into contact with them. Is that what you mean? Yes. Talk about that, because I know that um, <laughs> Let's just, let's just get real. I have, I have a, a, you know, I think we probably all have many artist friends for whom things like marriage and children 
are simply out of the question because of the perceived um, drain on their autonomy and time. Um, what's been your experience as a person who's there and obviously you work, but you continue to make art? Well, my first wife left me because of my artistic aspirations. And uh, it's just the way the dice roll. Um, but I just pursued my passion. And I do believe that my faith, I know my faith is the same. And my current life has been uh, incredibly supportive. It's interesting that she doesn't work. And we are this, um, she's my, um, she's my bookkeeper, she's my tax person. And so we have a unique, very unique relationship. We have a genuine partnership in life. And um, <clears throat> fully believes in what I'm doing as I believe in what she's doing. Thanks. Yes. And then, um, okay. When I graduated with my art degree many, many years ago, I didn't think it was possible to pursue my art and didn't take myself terribly seriously as an artist. So, um, and I got married when I was kids and I was afraid to pursue my art and the conflict that that would bring as a parent because I parenting is so demanding. Really is to do her job. So I put that on hold. And then um, when my youngest was in junior high about 15 years ago, I started pursuing my art more seriously, found a Russian artist to study under and continued going in that way. And my husband um, supported me in my art, so I didn't have to work. Um, and so I contributed to him, helped put him through school. Then years later, he has been helping me. And But it still was comfortable enough that I didn't have that drive, that fear of, oh my gosh, if I don't work, I'm going to starve. <laughs> and so um, it's only been in, in more recent years when I realized what were the things that are internal that are preventing me from really going full force, and what are the external things that are, are preventing me. And I needed to get a bigger studio, because I was sculpting up a circular staircase into a small area. And I had to work on the internal things of the fear and those things that, that bound me and kept me from really going wholeheartedly. And so just recently, I really am pursuing that. I'm, it's a step of faith. Um, I couldn't have done it without my husband. Maybe I could have done it without my husband, but that's just the way it worked out. And I'm finding, I'm not in the art, general art world. My work is primarily, my, my clients at the Catholic Church, um, hospitals and more liturgical um, clients, but um, anyway, it's just a different perspective. My husband's been terrific in all of this, and it's just different. Thanks. Thank There's someone uh, back here. Oh, I'm back here. Um, I'd like to make a couple comments about the practical side of art. Is that uh, Having a little, having a plan is not a bad idea. And I ran away from that planning forever and forever. And finally, uh, I got a good accountant, which told me that I had to look at the math and do all the little things that you do in math. And I've been doing it now, don't laugh, about a year and a half. <laughs> So uh, it, it's, it's okay, so I've learned something there. And uh, the second thing is, the last couple of weeks, I've been uh, searching the internet in my area where I live and finding a lot of competitions and stuff like that that I've entered. And I, I used to ignore all that for whatever reason and I uh, get to meet the galleries and I have to pursue it like a business person and that's okay. And the other thing about community is that I don't need, really need a large community. I have a great wife and uh, I'm also very fortunate to have a great friend and I haven't mentioned her name who happens to be Roberta 
who about 35 years ago was told me and gave me a good kick in the rear end and told me that I should pursue this. And it's 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 very it's a wonderful thing to have someone like the young lady mentioned her parents who really supported her, and that's very helpful. So sometimes it takes a little while, but and the other the last, my last point is for me really to become an independent artist. Uh, it was I, I had to jump over the cliff and believe that. Uh, the Lord was going to answer all my prayers for provisions and stuff like that. And it was a very, very difficult thing to abandon work and everything and just pursue art because um, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant child and I come from a home where you must work very hard and, and then you get your money. So I had to deal with um, a deep history of you must have a regular job, and it doesn't matter if you like it or it doesn't matter. So I don't know if that's that's Thanks. a bit of my journey. Hope it's all. Just here for the gentleman. Thank you. I, uh, my question is, what do you see is, or is there a value to having an economic pressure on an artist to force them out and to motivate? get out and create value and, and so on and so forth, versus if there was the possibility of life of not having those pressures, what, what do you see as the value of one life or the other in terms of what it brings out in your craft? Go for it. Thanks. Um, I was actually going to kind of make this reflection as well, that, um, yeah, I think it's easy to idealize selling work as like, that's a goal that you can reach, and when you reach it, I'll be happy all the time. It's very, very interesting how it, it's a subtle but sudden dramatic shift. Subtle dramatic shift. <laughs> um, it's a shift. Uh, basically, from suddenly, you know, like I fought many years like to make the work that I wanted to make because I really believed it. Nobody else wanted to see it, but I was showing it to them anyway, and I was making it. And then it's very different when suddenly people want it, and suddenly you're, you're not making it because, well, you are making it because you want to make it, but you're also making it because there's a demand. And I don't think anyone ever prepares you for the way that that shifts your thinking, um, or, or the way you have to fight for it not to shift your thinking. Um, because suddenly, it's very easy to feel like you're working in a factory and you're, you're supplying to demand. And then that, that goes against every reason why you became an artist. And, and then you're suddenly like, uh, you know, like, I, have, I battled with 100 million voices in my head and I spent all, all day in my own studio, so that's pretty fun. <laughs> um, so that's kind of one thing. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I guess I just think that, 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 you know, so for me, the benefit of, of having deadlines and having kind of demands on my practice is that deadline is a wonderful thing to make you work because, you know, I love what I do, I, you know, I want to do it, and yet there's no structure to what I do. So, um, you know, I can have days where I'll go to bed and set my alarm for 8 o'clock and be like, I will be in that studio by 9, check it out. And I'll wake up at 9 and then I'll somehow manage to, uh, I have an incredibly, incredibly, uh, you know, impressive ability to faff and I'll get I'll get to my studio by midday and then feel like an to failure and feel like the eyes of the world are on me going, see, your your work is a joke. Um, and so actually having a deadline really helps to kind of you know I mean I still do that, but you know it helps to, <laughs> it helps to kind of actually force you to you know like it gives you a structure to otherwise a structure that you have to enforce on yourself, which is hard. But uh, also, you know, obviously opportunities to show your work is kind of what you want to do because you want to A, you know, like not just make it for the studio but make it for, you know, to arrive in an exhibiting position. But also so you can then critique it in the context of ex exhibitions as opposed to critique critiquing it in the studio. And that's a different kind of critiquing. And then obviously to hear people feeding back on your work is a way as well generating the way you think about what your work is doing and the way your work will then progress. 
So those things, so in a lot of ways, as, as, as difficult as it is to have you know, demand in practice, it's obviously way better than it is for um, yeah. Where the tension comes to bear in my own work is that, um, and this is simply the inclination of my imagination, I tend to make large things that no one in their right mind could install or buy to put into a domestic setting. So I pigeonhole my practice into really only being palatable for collectors, serious collectors to museums, of which I don't have many. <laughs> um, and I wrestle with that. I wrestle with the, um, the discipline of saying, perhaps you should concentrate on photography for a while, or some painting. Not as a relinquishment or a, a pardon me, um, uh, a running away from maybe the heart of the practice, but that the idea of stewardship of the calling that I feel in my life, which is, you know, if money grew on trees, I would plant a grove, but it does not. And, and so that's a very real um, issue. And I am married, and I have a seven-year-old, and I have another one on the way. And so those, those practical concerns um, and, and sort of uh, learning how to grapple with those and that art addiction um, is a challenging one, I would say, of compromise. Yeah, I read Genesis 3, and um, you know, cursed is the soil because of what you've done. By the sweat of your brow, it will bring up fruit from the ground. And this is the uh, this is the world that we live in. It's a world in which um, the, I think that, that our role as redemptive agents within uh, amongst the rocky soil um, is one where uh, we have to embrace the fact that. Uh, I'm an idealist as well, but that compromise is simply probably uh, just another part of the world that I'm going to inhabit. Can I just go off something? Absolutely. Um, so the interesting thing about the surprise of selling work and how that shifts your thinking, and you know, some of you may be thinking, well, you know, lucky you, you get to have this weird shift that you're going to explain to me, well, great, I'll never get there, but you know, it, maybe somewhere in the archives that you shuffle away from this weekend, at some point you bring this back to your thinking when it happens to you. Um, it's just an incredibly weird experience. I did this series of drawings that were immediately snapped up by a bunch of people, and the gallery got really excited. Oh, make more of those. <laughs> you know, and there was this impulse in me going, like, I should make more of those. And I suddenly couldn't. It was the weirdest experience, and it's been a year and a half since then. I'm like, I would like, I would sincerely, I'm telling you, too, I would like to be able to make more of those drawings. But they're not happening right now. And I had to just give myself the permission to let that weird creative tick be allowed because I felt I was repeating myself. And that was an authentic creative aim that, or reality that was higher apparently in my priorities than the money. Um, and so that was just an interesting thing, and part of the job as an artist and in making it in the nuts and bolts is you do have to pay attention to yourself. You have to look at your habits. You have to take inventory of the way that you, ways that you work, the habits that you have. And in some cases, you can intentionally jolt yourself out of them. Um, but half the job is being self-conscious, and hopefully not a uh, Hopefully not a self-crippling way. Self-conscious in a way that can hopefully um, help you to tinker with the toy and make it a little um, more effective for your aims. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about was off of uh, what you said, Ali, with um, having a plan and all that sort of thing. And you're describing a lot of left brain um, exercises, essentially. And that can be overwhelming to the typical personality package that comes with the creative artist type, which breaks out into a rash when we hear that kind of talk. So what I realized with some of that was like, okay, well that creates fear in me when I hear that kind of thing, but I know I need to do it. So what I realized is something I can do is develop habits. I can start to develop these patterns in my life, because I love pattern, I 
and you'll be finding out more about that later. But um, I realized that, oh, this is something, and then again, this is a, a fruit of being self-conscious. I don't mind building habits. It actually is interesting for me to do that and see what happens. And so I realized, okay, well, some habits are more helpful than others, and some are going to help me to be to succeed in these, these dreams that I have. So, okay, one of them is that I become a morning person because I'm more alert then, and this is different for different people. I understand it's a little strange for an artist, but it's really good for me to be in the studio at nine. And um, that's just me, and that's because I've made it a practice to notice the things that work and build habits around them. Uh, and then the final thing I wanted to say is, so that's a way out of like getting out of that initial fear reflex. <laughs> You're talking about spreadsheets. Run! You know, so uh, no, there's, you can build habits. It's a great thing. It's a good way out. Still get what you probably need. Um, the other thing I wanted to propose, just, just lay out there, is that um, so there's this thing called resumes, right? And you're supposed to have them. And uh, what's interesting about them is they're this, basically this narration of success. And frankly, there's an invisible document that accompanies a resume that no one talks about. And this is, uh, I think of it as a really interesting, someone should do this. They should look at all the great historical um, figures and attempt to fill out what this invisible document would be. And it's a list of attempts that didn't pan out. But that list is just as critical, if not more so, than the list of successes. I would say more so. That should be, that invisible document should be 12 times the size, thickness of your resume. And don't worry, the people that um, are famous, that you know off the tip of, that whose games roll off the tip of your tongue, they have an invisible document that weighs 500 pounds. I promise. That's the reason you know their name. Let's shift gears at a really inorganic time. Um, because you bring up, uh, because we've got 15 minutes left, but you bring up this, uh, this issue of identity. In other words, that resume. Um, can be a significant source of your identity as an artist. It's an easy way of identifying you. Um, but we all know about the secret document of failures, which is um, something that we've all had to learn to weather. Um, and I think in a certain sense of a Christian, I mean, I'm not inventing this idea, but you know, been challenged to um, formulate a theology of failure. Um, that is, how do we as Christians um, Obviously, this is more than a 15 minute conversation, but how do we as Christians? Um, because we are uh, sort of externally, the external demand is to, uh, is to, to prove our potential for success um, and to, in a certain sense, diminish that sense of failure that we all actually live with secretly. And how? Maybe, you know, how does your faith, how does your faith, how does our faith um, help us, I would say, uh, live above that thread of success and failure? Maybe. Go. I think this is connected in a way to our early conversation about community and those who have around about you. And so to, to have people around about you help you identify where you are in your career what kind of work you're making, what kind of artist you are. It might be that at your particular stage in career, you are a local artist who exhibits in local art galleries, and are not an international artist. And that's okay, um, but it is healthy to have people who can help to identify that that's what your practice is, and liberate you to doing that. Some of us are going to have an international career. Most of us are probably be local artists. For some of us, teaching art will be around the table with our children. And all of these models of our practice are acceptable and valued within the kingdom of God. And neither in God's eyes is seems greater or lesser, but different. And I think this is where a Christian community can help within that. In his book, Bearing Fresh All of Leaves, the Christian philosopher Calvin Seerbelt writes about the importance of Christian community. 
And this is different from artistic peers, and peers who speak the gallery and say, oh, great to see you, but what they're really thinking is, what can I get out of you? But Christian peers who will love you kindly enough to speak into your work and tell you if it's any good or not, what's missing, what's lacking, what can be improved, those who can pray with you for opportunities, and people who can point you back to your identity in Christ, which I think is very blatant in in the question that our, because Christ is resurrected, we have nothing to fear. Our success is found in Christ, which liberates us within our career to make the kind of work that's perhaps a bit more, a bit more interesting. But I think community can help. This is something that goes back to that whole idea of making a plan, which I kind of was like, ah, uh, because you can make a plan, but then, like, in, in art, it just doesn't really want like, forget your plan, there's another plan. Um, and I guess, and I, for me, that sort of also is a good way of summing up, like, how you keep going, is, is knowing that you can make all the plans if you want, but it's worth just got the plan, and, uh, and that's what you're part of. And it might be, that you know, God's plan is that you make work internationally, you know, for ten years and then it stops. Uh, like not because you stopped wanting to do it. Like it could be that you stopped wanting to do it. It could be that suddenly the opportunity to do it stop. And actually, you know, like, and I, I guess I think like I try and you know take it as a real blessing. I'm able to do it full time at the moment because I don't have the expectation that it's going to be like that forever. Um, and I think that's that's a good way to think because if it does end up carrying on like that, then I'll be surprised and amazed. Uh, or if it doesn't, I won't be as devastated. Um, because I think the main thing is that is that you're you're aware that this plan that you're you're part of is not the one that you're controlling. Um, so, you know, God's controlling that, and and that's the thing that kind of keeps you going. You know, because you, in every step of the way, as you were saying, you pray, don't you, that that. <laughs> If it's right, it will happen, and you know, God will open doors or shut doors where it needs to. And that's kind of the only approach you can make to, to life. And like, of course, you have to try and be ambitious and try and do it really well and try and be on the scene. And that's how you get part of, that's how you be part of an artistic community is by being there, being on the scene, going to open to meeting artists. And you know, that's how you kind of push your practice forward is by being ambitious. But, you know, like, that's only going to carry on if it's God actually. Yeah, someone over here. I, uh, I kind of did things the wrong way. I, uh, I graduated from Biola and uh, got married right off the bat and then had a kid. And that really could mess up your artistic career for quite a while. Uh, but on the good side, it kind of gave me a long view. And me and Christian gives me kind of a long term view. And, and, uh, a lot of people my age now are just having kids who get started. I don't have any energy for that. My kid's going into college. And honestly, I, I was not prepared for the art world in my 20s. Sort of in my 30s and now in my 40s. My 40s are much better uh, career-wise than my 20s and 30s ever were. So having a family first is, is not a bad thing. And uh, I would encourage that to <laughs> people to think about that too. Thanks. And I think on this issue of identity, um, that, that ultimately our identities are as people who have been loved, not, not for what we've achieved. And that really dismantles and undercuts a lot of uh, uh, my misplaced uh, self-identifications. <clears throat> I think the second thing is that within that, then our calling is toward shalom and towards producing flourishing in people and in communities that we're a part of and aesthetic flourishing, whatever kind of flourishing we can, so that um, having having family and having children is is a wonderful part of that. Uh, and, and that's a bigger, the, the, the way that we foster Flourishing in in others and in our in our communities in our world is is bigger, higher part of our identities than uh, my 
fleeting uh, success of this or that. And that it, it, it resituates whatever fleeting success might happen with this or that within the context of is it producing inflation? Yeah, I agree. And I think that the, the way that we define the word success has a lot to do with We're given two mandates in Genesis. Um, is the end of Genesis 1? Yeah, I think it's the end of Genesis 1. The, the first, and I actually don't, I don't read them as Gordon, although you know, I'm not a theologian um, or an architect or a philosopher. Um, but uh, we're you know, commanded to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it with this idea that we are, um, we're called to both get our hands dirty and stuff of the earth, in addition to continuing to uh, the people of the earth. And, um, and so I think that it, that shades my, my idea of success, that the, the, the affirmation that I struggle to orient myself to is that final affirmation of, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, not, I want you to be shown. At the table, turn off all is all yours, you know, <laughs> which is um, we've got five minutes left. Um, I want to be conscious of uh, if there are any logistical concerns, if there's any announcement that needs to be made. Um, otherwise, maybe we'll kind of uh, wrap it up. Um, assuming I need to know on that end. Why don't we give you guys a chance? We've got five minutes to say maybe one final quick word or, um, you know, a charge, if you will, or, or not. <laughs> Let's conclude there. Well, yeah. <laughs> I was talking to Jeff Rao during the break, uh, and he, he reconfirmed this um, for me. That, that ultimately, it, if I were to picture what a Christian artist is, if that's sort of what we're talking about here. I don't know if that is. Um, but if if I was to picture what a Christian artist is, I. I would, I would want it to be um, someone who is um, winsome. I mean, I think this is a helpful exercise. So, sort of what, what, who, you know, on the question of identity, who am I? Someone who is winsome. Someone who is able to um, not just defend positions or assert positions, but is is a very hospitable. Uh, hospitable to others of uh, uh, points of view, uh, hospitable towards uh, what's being made in the artwork, uh, hospitable to other artists, um, someone who is able to kind of move across um, disciplinary boundaries uh, and and uh, do that well, do that excellently, um, and I think ultimately it's a it's a measure of uh, the extent to which we uh, are. Of producing flourishing in others. I would like for the Christian artist to be regarded as an extremely beautiful person, uh, having a beautiful impact in um, the lives of people in, in, in even mundane life. Yeah. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.